live forever against them. And he passes on. You should change his countenance and send him away. The son should come to honor. But he does not know it. They are brought low. And he does not receive it. But in flesh, will be in pain over it. And his soul shall mourn over it. Man who was born of a woman is of a few days. And the text says, he is full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow. It does not continue. Do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? No one. The number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. The text says, look away from him that he may rest. Till like a hard man, he finishes his day. The text says, for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. Though its roots may grow old in the earth, and its stumps may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water, this not the text, it will bring buds and bring forth branches like a plant. Anybody that dies in the Lord is not dead. They just transitioned on. That's all. And if you trust and believe that the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead, so shall Sister DuBose be raised from the dead. We trust and believe that word. We can look at ourselves and look deep down and say we're going to miss her. But I will see her again. Because my trust is in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Family. Brother Mitchell, the Mitchell family. It's going to be okay. 
I tell you, cry and weep. But just know she's okay. Believe me, you're going to miss her. You're going to miss her. But God's word never fails. It is true. It is true. It is true. This time we're going to have a song from the choir. After the choir comes, I shall, after the choir is finished, I shall be back. Simons will come and read the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. Amen. This is a psalm of David. The text says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. Humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. May God bless his most holy word and may it comfort this family. Let's pray. Amen. I'll be reading from Revelations 21, chapter, verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud shout from the throne, 
saying, look, God's home is now amongst his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God, he will wipe away every tears from your eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. I read this in the only name that matters, in Jesus' name. I'm praying for you, family. Amen. If we would, let us bow our heads in prayer. Our God Almighty, and in the name of your Son, Jesus, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we do come to you now praying that you would intercede and allow your Holy Spirit to permeate the hearts of those that are in the presence of this service today. Father, we recognize that there is an emptiness that has been, been provided, and I say it that way because with the emptiness of one that's being taken home, God sends his son Jesus to fill that emptiness. And so we pray now that in the midst of all of this, that the joy would be seen in knowing that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is indeed present. God, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would, would guide us in being able to, to say things or present things uh, that would be comforting to the hearts of the loved ones and the family and friends of, of our sister, Sister DeVoe, and that we would indeed be able to see your son Jesus manifest himself in, in spirit in our hearts today. God, we pray that we would indeed be respectful in the way that we worship you, in the way that we celebrate the life of our sister. Bless us now, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray, and all of your saints shall say together, Amen, and praise the Lord. now have we we'll now have our acknowledgments quiet quiet then we'll come back with the acknowledgments right after that Oh, the last 
Celebration of life. I mean, I mean, it is what it is, but this is a celebration of life. And, and we have to remember her. You, you ought to think back. Think back to the time when you was with her and how she made you feel. This is a celebration of life. It's a celebration. Listen, listen, we're gonna do. But it's a celebration of life. It's an appointed time once for everybody. So you celebrate. Celebrate a life. Celebrate a life. I'm telling you, you weep, weep, brother, brother Mitchell. I'm telling you. But celebrate a life. If she can come and talk to you all right now, she'll say, celebrate. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. I'm just saying. That's just me now. That's just me. It's a celebration of life. We're going to have our announcements at this time. Acknowledgements, I'm sorry. Acknowledgements. Joseph Missionary Baptist Church. 
to the Mitchells and all the family of this loved one, we do offer our condolences. We ask that um, you allow the peace of God to reign over all of you, and God bless you. Thank you. Amen. This is a big family here. This is a big family. Great right day in the morning. Y'all got the whole the whole aisle right here full. Can you imagine when y'all get together and start talking about it? The smile that's going to come to your face. The rejoicing that you're going to do with some co-workers in here. When you get with the family and y'all start talking about it, you're going to start celebrating a life. You're going to start. You're going to start. Okay, we had a slideshow, but it's not working. So, uh, it's a problem with, it's a technical problem with it. So, we're going to move on. Amen? Uh, reflections. I need three people. Three people. Raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Give us some reflection. Three people. Three people. Well, can I get one? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It's a reflection of life. Good afternoon, everybody. son and I, some would say, and um, my way of doing things might be a little harsh, but this was the best of the child. But to make a long story short, she thought I was the devil because I'm strict, but I'm really the equalizer. So she would always watch me, and I'm always watching her. I was doing my own, my own. So that is my memory of Mimi. Mimi, great mother, loved her child, loved her. But like the woman said, bad day. If you, when you leave here. Celebrate it. So she, she, she summoned, she summoned, God using her to summon y'all here to celebrate. To celebrate. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. Um, if anybody that um, can tell you anything, it's me, her mother. Um, my daughter is, uh, I had, um, when I wrote the obituary, I'm like, doing. Um, like I said, if you read throughout the uh, obituary, it was hard, but when I started thinking of, like you say, celebrating um, her life and how she touched a lot of individuals, I have received so much love from her co-workers, people, friends, family, of how Mimi came in and just touched people's lives, and I know she had a beautiful heart. Every time you see her, she had that big Cheshire smile um, on her. Um, I'm going to miss her. Um, we were so close. She loved traveling. Um, she loved seeing the world. She loved food. She just loved people. She was quiet, reserved, but when she um, got in your presence, you know, Mimi's presence was just there. So everybody has said the same exact thing about her. So whatever I <laughs> wrote in that, <laughs> I had family members like, who wrote this book? I did. Okay? <laughs> I did because I know my daughter and I was able to <laughs> Just share her memories, Come on here. you know, and I, you know, I love my daughter through the good, bad, ugly, indifferent. Amen. So um, I just want you all to just, anybody that she touched, lives that she touched, just hold on to those memories. And her son, you know, Roger, we are here, baby, we're here for you. Um, his aunt, you know, he goes back and forth to Jamaica, but um, we, we, we got to pull together for him. So 
And I thank everybody. I truly do. Thank you. Can I ask a question before the next one comes? Is, is that Mimi right here on the back of this? Now, you know what? She's brave. Because there's no way in the world I would have got that close to the edge. Holding my hands up. She looked like she was having a ball, too. It's a celebration. I'm looking at the pictures in the obituary, right? Looked like she enjoyed her family. It looks like she enjoyed some of her co-workers. It's a celebration. It's a celebration. One more. somebody. Meet me with somebody. At this time, we're going to have a song of preparation for the words of comfort. After the song is being sung, prepare your hearts from here from the angel of St. Joseph Missionary Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Gregory Ph.D.
Amen. 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 It is never a human joy to come and preach a funeral or a celebration of life or whatever we like to call it, home going or whatever. But to me and, and believers, all of you that are here, know that spiritually it's a joy because we know that God has completed his work. We will never understand it. Don't, don't, don't. Any preacher that will come to you and say, let me, uh, let me uh, counsel you and I'll give you the, uh, let you see the joy of what is happening, run as quick as you can because he's a liar. There is no way that the emptiness that God has brought when he moves one out of, out of this space and time can mean joy. And the Bible tells us that. He says grieve. Jesus says grieve. But don't grieve like the world does. We have a special way of, of, of grieving because part of it is joy because we know God is in the midst of it. Satan can't take a life. Don't get that foul up mixed up. Satan don't have that power. God dictates that. God has a sign, a day that we sunrise and a day that we sunset. And nothing can interfere or intervene in that. Now, God may use different avenues. He may even use the hand of Satan to do it. But it's not because of him and not because of anything else, but because God has decided. So in that, we who are believers know that there's a joy that we can celebrate. And the difference is that believers will grieve for a time, for a moment. It, it is so sad when you see loved ones grieving two and three and five and ten years, still crying and, and breaking up, you know, after multi-years when loved ones have gone on. That, that's how the world grieves, you know. But God will carry us through a moment of grieving. And then miraculously, those of us who are believers, he opens our hearts so that we can see that where that emptiness that came about, he has placed his son Jesus. And that we can go forward and rejoice in life like we've never done before. Father, we do thank you for it is indeed a joy to stand as your instrument. Father, I profess and confess openly that I am never and never was qualified or never be qualified to be your instrument for your service. But you chose. You decided. And so in that, there's joy knowing that the best that I can be is to be obedient to what you have called in my life. Pray now, though, Father, as I stand still as one who may sin, that you forgive me of my sins, and then, God, you speak. You know what needs to enter the hearts of, of your people. You know what the words of comfort are that will bless their spirit. So you be present right now. Jesus, magnify yourself in our midst. Lift yourself in our midst so that we can experience the joy of your presence. Bless us now. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all of us shall say together, Amen and praise the Lord. Give an honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to the men that are on the podium with me, Reverend Gibson and Reverend Simon, who is floating around. He was seeing about his son. He's in the building. You know, we got a couple of things going on, so that's where, you know, we'll, we'll see him back in a minute. Uh, to Pastor Tompkins, I do see you and recognize you. I understand that you want to sit with the family. Amen. But I want to make sure that we recognize you. And any other men of God that are in here, you know, God bless you and God honors 
what you do, and, and, and I know that our jobs are without end. So God bless you. To the deacons uh, that are in our presence, deaconesses, and, and definitely to the choir, thank you all for being obedient, and thank you so much for the appropriateness of the songs that you do sing in preparation for our worship and for our uh, words of comfort. To the organists, musicians, uh, the drum, we always forget the drum player, but you know, when I say mu musician, I'm speaking of her as well. Sister Teresa, I lovingly call her. God bless you. The director to the ushers, thank you all for your obedience. And to the multimedia ministry, we overlook them quite a bit, but without them, you know, we sound terrible from the pulpit. You know, we don't, we're not able to project God's word as we should if it wasn't for their faithfulness. So God bless you in, in what you do. And of course, to my, my lovely wife, my darling wife, who is so precious. God bless you, my dear. God has, has blessed our hearts with, with a word uh, from heaven. And I can see a word from heaven because it's from God's word. Jesus makes no mistakes. Jesus makes no mistakes. One of the many things that I love about Pastor Tompkins is that he makes it always clear whenever he preaches or whenever he, he you know, this is Jesus church, Jesus pew, Jesus chair, Jesus roof, Jesus electricity, Jesus everything. And, and I've always admired him for that because he makes it clear to anyone that's listening on, it's all about Jesus. If it were not for Jesus, none of us would have anything to be joyous about. Paul says in his writing, we would yet still be in our sins. And how grievous is that? But today we're here celebrating life. And, and the one thing I want to say up front, and, and I'm going to be honest from, from my heart, um, I, I didn't see anything in the obituary that said anything about her, her, her confession of faith or whatever. Doesn't matter. Here's why. We don't know what God does with one in the quiet of their heart. We don't know. We don't know. And that's why God says there is no judging one another. That he decides by way of his Holy Spirit, he decides when the wind blows in your life. It's his choice. He decides. What we come to grips with is what God has done in our lives so that we can be workers in the kingdom. That's why he told his disciples when he sent them out to, to, to do their thing. He says, guys, look. He says, look, the, the, the fields are white. In other words, I have gone and did the saving. What I want you to do is go spread the gospel so that they will find out that they're saved and become useful workers in the kingdom. So I'm saying all of that to say this, let your hearts be at ease. If there's anyone that has any doubt or feeling any sort of way, that that's an issue that was left between Sister DeBoth and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today we're here to celebrate life. Because there's evidence that there's something wonderful that Jesus has done. Look at you all. Look, look at you. I can't ima remember when we have had a family that fills up a whole section. You know, so, so God has done something in the midst of this family. And so, so I, I commend you on that. But the thing to understand is that God has a place for her. We see that coming out of the scripture when God was trying to, to comfort the hearts of, of, uh, of his disciples, of, of the men that were following him. When he was preparing the time, getting ready to go to the, to the cross, he knew that, that they were uh, going to be uh, without joy. They knew that they would be grieving because they saw something in Jesus that they did not see in any other man that walked on the earth. 
They didn't at the time understand because they didn't recognize him as truly being God in flesh at that time. Even though Jesus had told them that, that he would uh, eventually die and that he would raise on the third day, they didn't remember it. And those that may have remembered it didn't understand clearly what all of that meant. So they were with sadness as he was preparing their hearts for his departure. And so in John chapter 14, you know, Jesus, Jesus spoke these words, and, and John recorded them for us, and I thank God for that. Jesus said, as he tends to even comfort the hearts of the loved ones and family and friends today, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's what Jesus was telling his disciples, and he's saying that to you today. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. You know, for, for, for many years, that last verse that I just read, last portion, well, verse 4, always puzzled me. Because I used to say, well, if they are questioning Jesus about where you're going, you know, and how come we can't go, you know, well, why would he in turn say to them and leave it at that? You already know. <laughs> you already know. You know, I would have been one of the ones, I probably would have been like, uh, which one? Uh, Thomas, okay, the, the doubting one, scratching my head. Like, you know, what, what do you mean by that? But he was clear on that because they knew that their trust in Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit that had been placed upon them to do the work that Christ had called them had prepared them for glory. And so the way was already set, even though they themselves did not know it at the time. And that's where a lot of us, in our hearts, I don't care where you are in your faith, there is still a bit of doubt in your heart. Am I going to see Jesus? What's going to happen when I die? Am I going to be locked up inside of a, of a coffin the rest of my life, looking up at the ceiling, waiting, and all, all these kinds of questions? But the joyous thing is, no. no. Because the Bible tells us clearly that the moment that we leave from this space and time, we are immediately in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beautiful part about it. There is a joyous celebration now. If, if, if indeed the Holy Spirit has touched the heart of this young lady, this young woman, she is in the presence, and she, if it was asked, would not come back. No matter how much she loves every single one of you, she is there with her Lord and Savior. And if you want to see her again, then you must also know this Jesus that she's talking about. You must also know this Jesus who has everlasting life, who has eternal life. But most important, especially for you young people, not only for the here and yonder, you know, you're sitting just like I used to be. Man, who weren't about 50 years from now, 80 years from now, if I live that long? I want to know what's going on now. But Jesus Christ has a purpose and a promise for you right now. He wants your life to be full of victory and joy even right now while you're living and waiting for that time to come. So to answer your question, yeah, there's a reason right now for you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a purposeful joy that will come in your life just knowing him because the Bible says for his children, for those that belong to him, whether you realize it or not, he orchestrates every one of your steps. He orchestrates your steps. Even though you may find yourself in the midst of stuff or trouble or whatever, you can rest assured you are not there to be destroyed. You are there because he's trying to teach you something. 
He's, you're there because he's trying to fix your life so that you can know better, as our parents used to say to us. But the joy is, is that he never leaves us alone. He's always there with us. In the middle of the night when people won't even answer your phone call when you're calling them, you just need a voice because that grieving is so, you know, one thing to remember, Jesus is listening. If you would hang the phone up and just find a quiet place in your heart, you would recognize that Jesus is right there waiting. And he can comfort your heart more than anyone that would be on the other end of that line could do so. Jesus is that and will be that for you if you would receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. While it was yet dark in our lives, Jesus reveals himself to answer the call of our emptiness. The grave represents darkness, emptiness, and torment that we find in our lives. In the grave, we expect to find the horror and hurt that attacks us on a daily basis. It should be a time of rejoicing to look into the grave and darkness and emptiness and find Jesus in the midst. That's where the joy is, is to know that he's there with us. Jesus has never promised that he would take us out of stuff. Please, that's so important. See, a lot of times we want to give up on him because, man, I prayed and prayed and he just would not deliver me. He would not. Jesus is not in the business of taking you out of stuff. He's in the business of being there with you and strengthening you through the stuff to where you would wind up just like the three Hebrew boys that I'm sure that a lot of you have at least heard during, the, during your uh, uh, Sunday school lessons. You know, even though they were in the midst of the fire, they looked and there was a fourth one that was there and, and he was as the son of God. And, 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 and the Bible says that when they came out of the fire, which they did, they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And that's what Jesus will do for you as he walks with you through this life. He won't, he won't take you out of it because he has a purpose of having you in there. But what you will find out is that he's right there with you and that he will guide you and, 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 and he'll be there for you to lean on him and, and he'll be there to encourage you to make the next step and to have the hope that when the morning light comes up that there'll be joy waiting for you in the morning. That's what Jesus promises each one of us. That's what he promises us. So, so, so grieve if you must, but grieve with the joy and hope in your hearts that Jesus has a purpose in doing all of this. Open your hearts so that he can see that purpose. Sometimes someone can be in the way of you seeing Jesus, and Jesus can love them so much and love you so much until he will move it so that you can truly see him. We don't understand that. And right now, we can't really fix our minds to give him the glory for that. There will come a time when you will, but right now you can't. Just understand that. There may be anger, there may be distress in your hearts or whatever, but, but recognize that God is able to comfort that and to move it and bring you the joy that he promised. There are three things that I want to bring this morning and that I'm going to to sit down. First of all, that we will have troubled hearts. We will have troubled hearts. God has done something drastic. And so our hearts humanistically is troubled. We don't understand death. The greatest fear of mankind is what comes after we close our eyes. That's, that, that is the, uh, across all of humankind, all the way back to the Garden of Eden and on forward since sin has come into the world that has been the one fear. And, and, and what God has done is he's, he's presented himself, he's done everything that he can, including presenting himself to be the curse so that we would not have the fear of what happens when we close our eyes for the last time. That we know that we can have faith to know that he's going to be right there waiting for us. 
That's the beautiful thing about it. You know, you, you hear stories about angels. The angels are going to come and, and usher me into the presence of the Lord. That's not what God promises. Jesus says that don't let your hearts be troubled because when that time comes, he says, I will come for you. I will come to collect you. And I will be coming, according to Zephaniah, with a song that I have prepared specifically for you. And, and, and I love to, to share with people, you know, you know possibly there's a, a, a tune or a ditty, as they would call it in the musician world, you know, a little thing that you can't put into words, and it stays in your mind, and sometimes when you're ironing, it comes and you hum it, and there's no lyrics to no kind of song, no kind of tune, but it's there in your heart. And I always wonder, could that be the song that God is preparing that you're going to be so familiar with when you hear it, when the time comes, when he comes to, to bring us home to himself? Because he says he will present us to himself. He will, he being Jesus, will present us to himself. He didn't say angels would do it. He said he would. You know, he probably would, would think the angels would forget and leave you somewhere while they stop for a rest break or something. You know, Jesus is so concerned that you be where he wants you to be, and that is with him. And that's what he said in, in, in the scriptures. You know, he says that when he was talking to, to his Lord in, in chapter, uh, uh, in the book of John, chapter 17, no, 17, I think it is. When he, when he had his prayer, and he said, uh, uh, I want them to be where I am. That's his greatest joy. That's why he came and died and, and, and paid the penalty, because he won as many as he could gather to be where he is in everlasting peace and everlasting glory. That's the Jesus that we are talking about. Believers are to... We would agree that's where the trouble comes in our heart, but not as the world. The second thing, preparations are made. Jesus says that he will go back and he will prepare mansions for us in our in his father's in his father's house. I looked at the scriptures in John, I mean in uh, Revelation 21. 22, 22, and uh, it gives the, 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 uh, the size of the New Jerusalem, which is referenced as the, the house of God, the New Jerusalem that's coming down after everything has been done with, after all of judgment has been completed and, and everything. And, and according to the, to the uh, uh, to the size of this new city, this new place, this new house of God that's coming down to man that John saw in his vision. He said that it was 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles, I'm talking about 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, a perfect cube. Now, in the calculation, because some say, well, you know, how is he going to have a mansion for us? And, I, you know, I mean, where is he going to put all this? How is all this, you know, relevant? Well, in, when we look at that size, we're talking about uh, a, a place that's 15,000 miles, I mean, 1,500 miles long and 600,000 stories high. You know, when you start to thinking about it, you're talking about billions of mansions, you know. I mean, it, it's beyond our understanding. Just, just trying to put into some type of physical portion in our minds, uh, how can God promise that? There won't be enough room. Yes, there will. And, and according to what the Bible says, it'll be room left over because uh, all of us ain't going to make it. You know, that, that's, that's, that's something that we have to come to grips with. You know, that's why you have to be sure in your heart that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, then he's not, he doesn't have any, any plans for your mansion on his, on his table. If you don't know him in the pardon of your sins, 
then you are not in, in the midst of all of this. So it, it behooves you to allow the Holy Spirit to touch your heart. And, and, and when he does, open your heart and let him in. Third thing is that the eternal home. Or oh, he has an eternal home plan for us. He's not going to have us as spirits just floating out there in space throughout our rest of our eternity. He has a place for us. After he gives us our glorified bodies, then he's going to be set us into what he has been warning all along was a perfect, perfect uh, civilization. Uh, when you read the scripture, uh, we're not going to be sitting by the riverside singing hymns and eating pork chop sandwiches and throwing the bones on the streets of gold and all of that. That's not what he has in mind. He has a, a, a civilization, and the Bible says that we as his children will be reigning with him as, as leaders, as governors, as mayors, as citizens. It will be a, 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 a civilization that is in perfection. Satan will be dealt with. Everything that's evil will be cast into the lake of fire, and there will be nothing but perfection. That's where we will be with him in eternity, and that's the joy that we have, and that's the comfort that we should have in our spirits, that we will be with him. Jesus desires to have us in heaven, and because Jesus desires it, Jesus will get the desire of his heart because the Father promised that he would that everything that his son has desired, the father will cast at his feet. And because he desires us to be with him, trust me, it's going to come to fruition. Our homes will be built in God's house. So we don't have to worry about anything going away. It's going to be under the auspices of God Almighty. And if God can control this entire universe, then he can control where you will be in eternity. God has it all planned out, brothers and sisters. It's not by happenstance. This is nothing that, that, that comes and goes and nobody knows why God does. And God has it all worked out. And he has it worked out for his perfection. When Jesus' work is finished, brothers and sisters, he's coming for us. Some of us, he's coming before the rapture. That's what is happening with, with Sister Debo. But there are a lot of us, as Jesus told his disciples, some of you will be when the rapture comes. But either way, we will all wind up that are children of God being with him for eternity. I don't know about you, but that sets my heart at a comfort level that I cannot imagine, knowing that I don't have to worry about walking outside and getting run over. You know, Friday night is <laughs> kind of cute. My, uh, uh, we have finished our program with the youth, and so one of the basketballs had rolled up under uh, my wife's car. And so I saw it, and I way that people are not told her not to move, I need to get it. And so it was a lot of frenzy going on. And so I was up under the car reaching, trying to get it, and she had put it in gear and was about to move. And I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. Can you imagine hearing the 6 o'clock news, pastor get run over by first lady? <laughs> but anyway. The point being that you never know how God is going to situate the, the, us leaving out of this world. But the promise is, my brothers and sisters, the promise is with the Mitchell family that he's going to be there for you. He is, without a doubt. And I tell you, with the Mitchell family, I love you so much because when, we, when the church called me, uh, they were the first family that started to bring in. I looked around, daughters was here, sons was here, grandsons, cousins, you know, just, just, you know, so you have a special place in my heart, a very special place in my heart, and I, and I, and I love you for that. I love you for that. And God is going to be doing marvelous things for this family. But the beauty of it all, Jesus says that no message is a gospel message until you are made aware that he went to Calvary's cross for you, for me. He went and died on that cross. They nailed him to that cross. And what's so important about it, important about it is that he did it for us. 
As a matter of fact, sometimes you need to, in your quiet moment, just just listen, just in your heart, just just see, just just go to the cross where He took all of this. And if you listen closely, you can hear the the nails hitting the mallet, the mallet hitting the nails that they were nailing him into his flesh. That should have been us. It should have been us. But He took our place. And the Bible said he didn't say a mumbling word. And the reason why he never said a mumbling word is because he was guilty. Not of his own sins. Jesus never sinned. But he was guilty because our sins had been placed upon him. And so as they were crucifying him, as they were torturing him, he never said a mumbling word. Because he knew that my sins, if nobody else's, mine was enough to send him to the cross. Mine was enough if nobody else was added in there. But he was nailed to that cross, lifted up, and the world saw him as he was lifted up and dying for the world. And the Bible says that he made one statement that stands out in my heart more than the other seven. He said, it is finished. It is finished. What that says to us, brothers and sisters, quit trying to get right. Quit trying to get saved. I hear this all over the place. You can't. Jesus finished it. He says, all I want you to do is believe and receive what I've done for you on Calvary. That's what Jesus is saying, because I have finished the work. Proof positive of that, he was in the grave for three days and three nights, as he had predicted that he would be. But the beauty of it all, because God in his holiness, in his righteousness, saw that he had paid the penalty for every sin, God blessed him by raising him from the dead, bodily and alive. He's ascended into heaven after 40 days on the earth, presenting himself, showing that he was raised bodily and alive to witnesses all over. At one time, the Bible says that he he presented himself to over 500 at one time that saw him and touched him and saw that he was flesh and bone. He wasn't just a spirit, as some may say. He raised from the grave bodily and alive which guarantees us we will have the same body in glory. When we receive our eternal home, we will receive it in in flesh and bone like him and being able to to operate in the same way that he did in those 40 days after he was raised from the dead. But he ascended into heaven and he sent his Holy Spirit back to live within all of his believers so we would have the strength and the power to live this life that he's calling for us to live in this day and time. But the end of the gospel, and this is where you need to hear it clearly, the end of the gospel is that he's coming again. That is a promise that has all of eternity nailed on it. He's coming again, and he's coming for his people. Will you be part of that? That's where the question comes. Will you be part of that gathering? And to be sure that that would be the case, if the Holy Spirit is knocking at your heart right now, just let him in. Just say yes. As a matter of fact, you don't even, you don't even have to come up and let us know. it. It's between you and God. I can't answer for you in glory, and your next door neighbor sitting next to you can't answer for you in glory. But you're going to have to answer. And there's only two things that Jesus is going to say during that time. He's going to say, either depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Or he's going to say, you good and faithful servant. Come into rest. Which one of those is he going to say to you? There is no third. The Bible gives us no third choice. Just those two. So please, if there's anything else that you gathered from today, it could be that Sister DeBose 
sent a special invitation for you all to hear this message. And this message is about Jesus. It's about Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone hears it. I pray that everyone will acquiesce to it. But that's all I can do is pray that that's the case. It's between you and my Jesus. I'm with you now, <laughs> Pastor. My Jesus. <laughs> God bless you. Morticians.